In this episode, we are going to learn a little of folklore about home and farm-loving fey folk, the helpful fairy spirits that sometimes live alongside humans in certain homes, mills or farms, carrying out good work in the night, helping keep everything clean and tidy, working on farm tasks that need to be done. There are many versions, how spirits are all over the world, and many, even just in the countries of England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales alone. These are incredibly shy creatures, mostly male, and yet there are a few female types. They cannot bear to have attention brought to them. To do this even with a kindness of human heart will give them so much stress and insult that they will simply have to leave that house or farm and move somewhere else. Even worse, they can transform into boggarts, wicked and quite dangerous creatures that are somewhat like the poltergeists. House goblins and hobgoblins, well, they just seem to want a quiet life, being useful, quietly appreciated, a simple life. Isn't that what a lot of us want to? I can completely understand the household fairy mentality, so better to simply appreciate these secretive fey folk in our hearts and heads and leave their little gifts of food for them to find on their own. Let's take a closer look, a quiet look, at some of these interesting fairy creatures. Brownies Brownies are a rather shy house spirit, hailing mostly from the country of Scotland. They emerge at night, while all the household are sleeping, working around the home and farm and bringing good fortune. As with all the house spirits, a bowl of milk or cream, a little cake or bread or porridge must be left out in payment for the good work. They are sensitive, principled creatures, easily upset and offended by humans and will leave if they feel offended or taken for granted. Or they may stay, but transform into boggarts, spiteful, nasty creatures with habits like the poltergeist. There is a tale that once there was a very mean-spirited housewife. She thought nothing of her servants. Seeing how much hard work the brownie did during the night, she berated the maids angrily and then fired them, placing all the work on the shoulders of the brownie itself, who of course, she didn't have to pay. The brownie would not stand for this and left, disgusted. He would only return the moment the maids had been given their jobs back. If there are lazy people in the home or farm, they should beware. Brownies will play pranks or even punish these people and can eventually become quite wicked. Brownies are usually described as quite ugly, with brown skin and are very hairy. Historically, they were thought to be the size of humans, maybe even a little larger, but over the time they have reduced in size to smaller creatures, looking a little wizened. In the lowlands of Scotland, the brownie is said to have no nose, only a single hole in the middle of its face. Further north, in Aberdeenshire, they were said to have no toes or fingers. I can only presume then that they used magic to clean the house. Sometimes brownies make themselves invisible. Sometimes they will shapeshift into the forms of different animals. The brownie mostly appears naked or dressed in a few rags, but never offer them clothes or laugh at them, because if you do this, he will leave straight away. It has been said if offended enough, they will run wild around the house and destroy all their own hard work and more. There was a brownie who lived in the borderlands between Scotland and England at a village called Cranshaws. This brownie for many years had tended the grass and threshed the grain. One day some fool speaking with casual human arrogance said the grain the brownie had taken care of was poorly mown and badly stacked. The brownie of course heard this, they missed nothing. 
That night the brownie took all the village's grain and carried it to a place called Raven Crag, miles away, and threw it right off the cliff there, muttering curses as he did so. Near the pretty village of Moffat, a place I visited many times with my family when I was a little girl, there was a family named Bodsbeck. This farm had a brownie, until one day, the owner of the farm poured the brownie's cream for him and called for him to appear to take the offering. This was a dreadful thing to do to this proud but shy creature. A foolish human had brought attention to the brownie. The brownie itself upped and left that very moment to another farm nearby at Leithen Hall. These creatures cannot stand to have attention brought to them, the same as some people. They just want to be private and left alone to do their own thing. Brownie has an association with those who have passed away, those who have died, such as in the tale of the cold lad of Hilton. The lad himself was a stable lad called Robert Skelton, and he was murdered by the Lord of Hilton Castle while in one of his usual rages. This poor child would appear in spirit naked, cleaning anywhere where mess was left keeping the castle clean until the spell keeping him there could be broken. Eventually it was, and I will tell you of this in a moment. In the 1700s in Shetland, in the country of Scotland, it was said that not 40 or 50 years before, every family had its own brownie, which served them. And they gave sacrifice for this service. When they churned their milk, they took a part of it and sprinkled every corner of the house with it for the brownie's use. When they brewed, they had a stone called the brownie stain, wherein there was a little hole and they poured some of it as a sacrifice for the brownie. They also had stacks of corn called brownie stacks, which although they were not bound with straw or rope or any other thing, as human stacks would, the greatest storm or greatest wind could never blow away a single piece of straw or corn. The brownie should never be given a name by a human. Maybe they have names in their own language secret to themselves, but they will not stand to be named by people. In Perthshire there lived a brownie that the people would hear splashing in a body of water. At night he would leave this watery place and visit a nearby farm. They would find little wet footprints that he had made as he had gone on his way. If he found messiness and an untidy place, he would do his brownie good work of cleaning. But if there was a particularly clean spot, he would mess that up. Humans had tried to do the work of brownies, and that was forbidden. The people of that area were very afraid of the brownie. They are not, after all, the prettiest of fey creatures, by all means, and they avoided going near the places that he frequented as the night drew in. One night, however, a man who had been to market, maybe given the courage of drink, heard the brownie splashing in the water and shouted to him, Puddlefoot, he called the brownie, Puddlefoot. The brownie shrieked in horror. A human had given him a name. The brownie vanished from that place and was never seen or heard there again. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, the other way to displease a brownie and have him leave your home is to gift him with clothes. In 1584, in Reginald Scott's The Discovery of Witchcraft, we find the very first mention of this strange habit, often leaving in a huff, reciting a poem as they go, such as, Gi brownie a coat, gi brownie a sark, yis ne get mere a brownie's wark. It seems that the brownie is insulted by the giving of clothes. Even the cold lad of Hilton spoken of before disappeared after being given clothes, although in this case, of the poor murdered boy, he had been heard longing for them and crying for them. As soon as the servants left clothes for this brownie to try and give the cold lad some comfort, he went, and it is said that he sung as he left, here's a cloak and here's a hood, the cold lad of Hilton will do no more good. 
In the 1800s in the English Midland county of Herefordshire, the hook that sat over the fire, where the pot would be hung for cooking, traditionally had a little crooked section, and this was known as the brownie's seat. If the hook in the hearth had no crook, a horseshoe instead would be hung, so that the brownie had somewhere to sit down. And this I find is a curious thing, because the fey folk are usually afraid to sit on things or touch things made from iron, and yet brownies are comfortable with it in this homely setting. Or maybe it is something that brownies only can do. A very similar story is told of the Scottish Wag at the Wa, who would sit at the pot hook. Cooks would swing this hook as an invitation for him to come visit the household. This particular brownie would punish lazy servants, but he loved children, although he could look very frightening. He was a short-legged old fellow with a long tail, dressed in a red coat and blue trousers, in an old-style nightcap on his head and a bandage around his ancient face due to his constant bouts of toothache. How very peculiar indeed. Sometimes old Waganwa would wear a grey cloak and join in with the family's laughter. Spooky. He was completely intolerant of anything but home-brewed ale and would be furious if the family brought in such a beverage. Hobs, Hobgoblins and Lobs In England, in the counties of Lancashire, Yorkshire and the Midlands, and also the borderland between Northern England and Scotland, the brownie has another name, the hobgoblin, and also sometimes the hob and the lob, and these have exactly the same characteristics as the Scottish brownie. This name was given to their species because of their association with the hearth, cooking and heating water on the hob. Of course today we still call the top of the cooker the hob. The great author Tolkien was a man of the Midlands of England, and the Shire is said to be based on his childhood landscape there, and of course he would have known about Hobbes. It is thought that the basis of the word Hobbit came from this word. The house and home loving Hobbes became house and home loving Hobbits. There is a tale told of a Hob that lived in a cave in Runswick Bay in North Yorkshire. The cave became known as the Hob Hole, and anxious parents would bring sick children to this place to be cured of the whooping cough. In the southwest of England, in Somerset, there is a pub there called the Holman Clavel Inn, and this is said to be the home of a hob called Charlie. It is surprising that the naming of this hob did not cause him to leave. And it just goes to show that when we think we know all about the Fey folk, a case comes along that contradicts everything that we have learned. The story was told by the neighbour of the pub, although all in the area knew about Charlie the Hob. It was said that he would perch high in the beam over the fireplace, cut from Hollywood, known as the clave or the clavy. Once, when the woman who told this tale was eating at the pub with a friend, who was a farmer, the servant set the table with the finest linen cloth and his full silver service. As soon as the guests had left that room and returned, Charlie the Hob had taken everything and put it back where it had come from. It was believed locally that the Hob of the pub did not like the farmer she had invited to eat with her. In Staunton on Wye in the West Midlands of England, one brownie living at the Portway Inn would repeatedly steal the keys of the family. Family worked out how to receive them back though. They would place a piece of cake on the hearth and sit around the fire with their eyes closed. Eventually the keys would be thrown at them from behind where they sat. And the lob, known as the lob by the fire, was classed as a rather larger sized brownie or hob that was happy to carry out work needed done around the farm in particular. The Bibach and the Booker In the country of Wales, the household fairy spirit is called a Bubach, 
and these are said to have very fiery tempers indeed. They are known to be short, quite round, have red hats, loincloths and big fur cloaks. They cannot stand teetotalers or those nosy folk who always meddle in other people's business. Gerald of Wales, writing in the 12th century, tells of a bubach that caused mayhem and havoc for a family household that had insulted him. Collecting tales of fairy folk in the 1800s, the folklorist Work Sykes, whose research I often use, described the bubach as a good-natured goblin helping young maids. There was a process to this. The young girl would sweep the kitchen and set a fire in the hearth, a churn full of cream placed by the fire and a fresh bowl of cream for the bubach sat next to it. If the maid was lucky, the bowl would be empty by morning and the cream in the churn churned perfectly. There is an alternative aspect of the bubach, and this is a darker natured creature a phantom that would sweep people away on the wind on behalf of those who had died knowing of hidden treasure and so their rest was not peaceful. The spirit would try to persuade the humans to remove the treasure but should they ignore the plea then the spirits would summon the bubach to take them away on the wind until they agreed to help search for the treasure. The human would be asked above the wind mid-wind or below wind. If they chose above wind they would be carried high as the clouds, a most terrifying and cold thing. If below wind then the person would be dragged through shrubs, grasses, brambles, briars and ferns. Mid-wind was the safer option. There was one bubach who took a real dislike of a local preacher. Every time the preacher would sit on his stool to pray, the mischievous fairy creature would kick the stool from under his bottom. He would play with fire irons to make them jangle and spook the maids. The preacher eventually grew terrified and took his horse to flee the area. However, in one last act of mischief, the bubach sat behind him on the horse just to torment him that one more time. There is another story told in Monmouthshire in Wales of a young maid who the folk suspected of having fairy blood. It was her task each night to leave the bowl of cream at the bottom of the stairs. One night she decided she would play a trick on the booker. Instead of cream, she filled the bowl with stale urine. The household spirit was furious so much so that he attacked her, he tormented her. The girl screamed so loud that the bucker fled that place, ending up at a nearby farm in Hafford and Innes. There he found a maid who did not mistreat him, and so he took on all the work of spinning her thread for her. Over time this girl grew curious about his name, but naturally knowing the secrecy of such creatures, he refused to tell her. One day, she pretended to leave the farm. Instead, she hid where the booker could not see her. Breaking his trust, she listened to him as he sang his name. Garani Throt. Disgusted, he left that place also and ended up in yet another farm. Here he came to be friends with Moses, the manservant. Sadly, Moses was killed at the Battle of Bosworth Field, and after this painful loss, the poor booker turned boggart, causing distress and fear all over the town. The Fenner Diary In the Isle of Man, well known as a fairy island, with tale upon tale of fairy folklore, the household fairy spirit is called a Fenner Diary known as an extremely strong and hairy creature, not very clever, but who could thresh a barn full of corn in just one single night as the whole farm slept. There is one tale from this magical isle. A Fenadiri was trying to round up a herd of sheep, but simply could not get one small grey one that had no horns to fall into line. 
Eventually the fey creature realised that it was no sheep at all but a hare. One Manx farmer made a huge mistake after a fenadiri had done so much hard work for him. He gave the gift of clothes to the house fairy in an act of kindness. Of course the fairy creature was furious, lifting each item one at a time and berating the farmer, telling of how each one would make him ill. The fairy spirit then took himself away, hiding alone on Rushton Glen. The Urusk In the country of Scotland there is a strange fey creature called the Urusk. These are feral fey folk, living close by wild water, rivers and waterfalls, similar and yet slightly different to the household goblins we have been learning about. Sometimes they are described as half man half goat, sounding a little like Mr. Tomnus from The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, although with longer hair, long claws and long teeth. Sometimes they are described as looking very old, with patches of fur, misshapen heads and even feathered patches on their necks and back. And sometimes they are described as having blue hats, yellow hair and always carrying a tall staff. When winter came, these fairy folk would come down to the farms and mills to take refuge from the cold. When in the wild, the Urisks were the cause of much hooliganism and trouble, guilty of butchery, arson and theft, people were known to have died of fright after meeting an Urisk. However, once domesticated, which apparently was possible as they were lonely at heart by nature, they became the most loyal defenders and the hardest workers of a household. Clan Macfarlane had a chieftain in times past who was actually nursed and brought up by a woman who was the wife of one of these Urusks. Clan Graham of Angus had a hard-working house Urusk. Clan MacLachlan of Strathclachlan's Urusk was given the name Harry. This is interesting because it did not cause the Urusk to leave, different from some of the other household spirits. Clans MacNeil and Fraser also had Urusk servants and protectors. There are, of course, other types of indoor spirits in the folklore of the old countries. Cellar ghosts are spirits who will protect the wine they held there from thieves. There is Lazy Lawrence who protects fruit orchards. Old Goggy is the protector of the household gooseberry patch, protecting it from children trying to steal the fruits that haven't ripened yet. Melch Dick guards nut bushes and trees. In the Scottish lowlands we can find the Kilmooley that lives in and protects mill buildings and all the produce there. Only the miller can control the Kilmooley and stop his pranks. And he is a peculiar looking fairy type, with a nose that covers most of his face, and no mouth at all. Also in the highlands of Scotland is Maggie Mullock, also known as Hairy Meg, due to her hairy hands and massive wild hair. At only two foot tall, she is very short and can shapeshift into a grasshopper. Her son was known as Brownie Claude, who was actually a species of a Dobby, and these are sweet-natured but quite dim-witted fairy folk. The story of Brownie Claude is a very sad one. One night a local girl travelled to the mill for flour to bake her own wedding cake. It was late, and the miller had gone from the mill, so the wicked girl broke into the mill to grind the flour herself. She made up a fire and put on a pot of water to boil while she ground the flour. Brownie Claude heard the noise and went to investigate what was happening. Finding the young woman hard at work, he asked her who she was and she answered smartly, Oh, I am me myself. Again he challenged her to tell him her name and again she replied with a quick tongue, Me myself. He began to walk towards her, and the stupid selfish girl picked up the pot of boiling water and threw it all over the innocent young brownie clod. 
the poor Dobby ran to his mother. She snatched him to her arms, asking who had done this to him, and all he could say in answer was, me myself, and then he died. Things, however, did not end well for this arrogant, stupid girl. Maggie had her revenge. The girl would brag to her friends about she had tricked a brownie, as she was so clever. She did this so many times, that eventually Maggie was in a place where she overheard her. The still grieving mother fairy picked up a stool that was nearby and threw it at the girl. The stool hit this girl so hard that she dropped down dead on the spot, and many said that she deserved nothing less for the murder of young Brownie Clod. Around the world there are, of course, other household fairy creatures, such as kobolds and tomties, and I will probably have to create another episode honouring more household fairies. There are many and varied, and these helpful little creatures are shy and secretive. So, should you find your chores being done mysteriously, and it's definitely not one of your family, just don't thank the fairies. Only leave a little bread and milk out. Your house is being blessed by fairy helpers. Thank you for listening to this latest episode. It would be lovely to have helpful fairies cleaning in our own home, but alas, no, it's down to us. And with three mischievous kittens in the house, as well as our other animal family, there is always something to clean. If you have enjoyed this episode, please click like. Please consider subscribing to the channel. We would be so very grateful. Thank you to everyone who's subscribed so far. It's very kind of you. Until next time, dear friends, keep well. As always, brightest of blessings. And remember, don't play with the fairy folk or you may end up in one of my folk tales yourself.